You ready? Okay. Yep. Hello, I'm Dr. Maria Solindro, <clears throat> specializing in integrative anti-aging medicine, practicing in Pasadena, California. Today, we have a returning speaker, Dr. Sherlina Bogart. Hi, Dr. Sherlina. Hi, Marie, Dr. Maria, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for filling this uh, topic that is so difficult for the patient and for the physician, oh. but I'm sure you, you can explain this for the community awareness. Thank you. Oh, thank so, you so much for inviting me. Yes, you're welcome. And for before we start, uh, I would like to introduce your background and uh, Dr. Sherlina Bogard is a board certified physician specializing in OBGYN. Graduated from Chicago Medical School in 2006. After her residency in Eastern Virginia Medical School, she spent seven years of her career doing obstetric gynecology in Illinois uh, in 2010. She realized quickly that there is a void in sexual health care, she uh, aspired to provide a compassionate and non-judgmental environment of her patients in 2017 until today. She offers telemedicine and also in-person service. In 2019, she started Intimi, right? Intimi Inc. Yeah. <laughs> Intimi, it's from intimacy, intimacy, and me, right? Yes, intimacy. The intimate, the intimate relationship you have with yourself is the most powerful relationship you will ever have. That's right. Oh my gosh. Okay, and I hope we have you again next time for that kind of topics. Today, she is helping us to understand some of the hormonal issue and also, um, and uh, that link to possibly link to endometriosis and abdominal at meiosis and then um well let me start with this question and this statement this diagnosis is very difficult for the patients because they are suffering and also for the physicians because none of those blood tests will show anything and sometimes even the diagnostic uh, uh, um, uh, diagnostic tools will not show so, but before uh, we go further, I would like just to start with the first questions, Dr. Sierlina. What is this endometriosis and adenomyosis and how often are women found to have this? Oh, those are excellent questions. And so, and yes, and, and like, you know, you referred to the difficulty being a healthcare provider and the patient. It's both of these are very frustrating diagnoses because you know, we have patients who will have these ongoing chronic issues and we have treatments yet some patients will respond wonderfully and some do not. And so it becomes this thing that just is frustrating for both the practitioner and the patient. So I'm happy that we're having this discussion today. But endometriosis, so um, endometriosis is when you actually have the cells that so every month when a woman has a period, the cells that line her uterus, if she does not get pregnant, those cells are shed out and she has a period. Well, sometimes those cells that line the uterus can actually start to grow outside the uterus. And so which she can have those implants anywhere in her body. Most commonly they would be in her pelvis, on her bladder, in her pelvis, but women have been known to have endometrial implants so far as up into her brain. And so they can appear anywhere in the body. With adenomyosis, it's the same concept, except rather than the cells migrating outside the uterus, they actually start to grow into the muscle of the uterus itself. And so rather than staying right on that lining where they should be, they start to extend into the muscle. And so now where you should have nice smooth muscle, you've actually got these active endometrial cells that respond to hormones. Amazing. So um, thank you. And why is it so important to distinguish the endometriosis from the adenomyosis? Oh, you know, actually because patients can experience a range of symptoms from either one, it's, 
it's more so for her, um, for her to feel like she knows what's going on and for the patient's empowerment. Um, and, you know, we like to have a diagnosis for things, but at the end of the day, when the woman has these complaints that are associated with her menstrual period, as the practitioner, my goal is to help her to be pain-free and to have periods that are not heavy. And so we may not always get a diagnosis because endometriosis is, it's actually a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning we don't really have a test to test for endometriosis. And so what typically happens is we try a treatment option and see if the woman responds. And likewise, um, the, with adenomyosis, it's what we call also, they're both diagnoses of exclusions. And so adenomyosis, unfortunately, we only definitively diagnose once a woman has had a hysterectomy and we look at the actual tissue under a microscope. And so the only way to definitively diagnose endometriosis and adenomyosis is by getting a tissue sample. And there are some women who um, have had laparoscopic surgeries in the, um, for endometriosis specifically where a surgeon has gone in and removed some of those endometrial implants. And then by sending those, what this tissue he's removed, a pathologist can look at it under the microscope and says, yes, this is endometriosis. Um, and so their diagnoses of exclusion, meaning we don't have a blood test that we can do. We can't really, you know, get a sample or a slide. We treat and see if the woman responds. And so we, we exclude any other possibility and they become diagnoses of exclusion. Yeah, oh, thank you for explanation. And that can take sometimes years. And this is why everyone is so frustrated, yes. And what are the complaints and the symptoms uh, due to this endometriosis and adenomyosis? Can you so, elaborate a little bit? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for endometriosis, it's usually pain. And depending on where those implants are, that will tell what the woman's pain is. And so if she's got um, implants on her bladder per se, or implants in her, in the abdomen itself, around the time that she has her period, so about a couple of days before her period comes when her hormones tend to go up, she'll start to have pain. And that pain will, can be anywhere in the body. And believe it or not, if a woman has implants in her brain, she may know, um, start to have seizure-like activity. And so it just depends on where those um, cells are implanted in the body. But the most common complaint is going to be pain that's outside the uterus, but is in conjunction with her period. So it's a cyclical pain, comes with the period, then goes away. And then every month around the time her period comes, she has this pain again. With adenomyosis, she can have very painful periods, but they're also very, very heavy because that those um, endometrial cells, those lining cells are growing into the muscle. That uterine is just contracting very, very strongly. So she has very, very strong menstrual cramps, but also very heavy periods. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, which, which is which diagnosed first? I'm sorry, I have to, um, you know, I, I'm personally wondering if you see it is almost like for sure this is adenomyosis. Is it adenomyosis actually diagnosed first usually? So I mean, um, they're, they're, they don't necessarily go hand in hand. So a woman may only have adenomyosis or may only yes. have endometriosis. I will say we see endometriosis more commonly than we oh. see adenomyosis. And so endometriosis occurs in about 10% of women, probably more than that. Um, it's just, you know, women, because of treatment, it's just not always the diagnosis isn't put on the chart. Um, but so endometriosis is more common than adenomyosis. And so, and like, you know, I referred to adenomyosis is only diagnosed once a woman has had a hysterectomy and we have that uterus, we actually have the uterus and we look at the uterine tissue under the microscope. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Now, why can endometriosis and adenomyosis occur? And can it be prevented? If it can, how can it be done? So, you know, we still don't know why they occur. We 
don't know why some women get them some and, and it can be you know in a family all every woman in the family has it or only one you know we've got six sisters and one has it and the other five do not and we don't have a really good understanding as to why it occur. Um, there are a couple of theories, the most common one being that there's retrograde flow of the menstrual cycle, meaning rather than all the blood just flowing out of the uterus, there's some, the cells spill through the fallopian tubes out into the abdominal cavity. And then those cells start to implant all over the body. And that's one theory. And then there's a couple of two other theories, but a little more technical, but you know, at the end of it, we're still not 100% sure. Um, how can a woman present, um, prevent them? There's no way to 100% prevent it from happening um, by having a healthy diet. Sometimes if you have higher estrogen levels, you're going to grow, your lining in your uterus is going to be thicker. And so that's going to increase your symptoms. And so women who um, have painful periods or heavy periods, just by making some small lifestyle changes, um, specifically with her diet and having what we call an um, anti-estrogen diet. So getting rid of things that increase estrogen in the body can be helpful. Um, also things that decrease menstrual flow. So some birth control for some women. And there's, you know, people, some people stay away from all hormonal birth control. Some people, you, you do what you have to do to address the symptoms. But if you're taking any type of hormonal medication that can decrease menstrual cycles, then you're going to decrease the endometrial um, implants from forming, but also can decrease adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is a little bit more difficult to treat than endometriosis. Um, and sometimes those women tend to have more severe symptoms. Mm, okay. Now you um, mentioned a couple times already these implants. Uh, can you please explain, is it the growth of the endometriosis somewhere is called implants? Yeah. And so, so it's the cells that line the uterus, those are called endometrial cells. So the inside of the uterus is the endometrium. So those cells that line the uterus, they migrate outside of the uterus and then they just attach themselves to other places inside the belly or onto the liver itself or anywhere into the lungs, into the heart, but those cells attach to other places in the body. And so they become implanted in a place where they aren't normally found. And sometimes you said it, it goes uh, up to the, to the brain. Yes. We've had women who ah. um, had endometrial implants in the brain. One other um, thing that and, and in my practice, I've had patients who've had surgery before, who have endometriosis, who have had either C-sections or who have had laparoscopic surgeries can get endometrial implants into the surgical site. And so they will notice that every month when their period comes, they have pain in a, in a scar, like a, um, in their, like they've had a laparoscopic surgery, they can have pain in that um, incision in the belly button. Or if they've had a C-section, there's like a little area that just gets inflamed and very tender around her period, and then it goes away. And that is something that I've seen a number of times in my career where women who've had previous surgeries who have endometriosis will have endometrial implants in the sites of the surgery. Wow, it's scary. It can happen at any age, anyone? Yes, anyone who is of um, menstrual age, so anyone who's having menstrual cycles, but most commonly we see it in women in their 20s and into their 30s. Mm, okay, so now, Dr. Sherlina, how big is the influence of lifestyle on the occurrence of the endometriosis and adenomyosis? So lifestyle is, is always going to be a part of any treatment that we discussed because like I said, if you're having high, high estrogen levels, so, um, and you're having heavier periods because so the way the lining of the uterus grows is it's influenced by our estrogen levels. Estrogen um, stimulates that lining. So when we have lifestyles that expose us to estrogen-like 
um, substances that's going to increase that lining, make heavier flow and can, can cause more endometriosis to occur. So by adopting anti-estrogen diets, um, getting regular exercise actually helps uh, maintaining your weight because as you know, the um, more body fat we have, the more estrogen we have. And so just by maintaining a healthy weight, um, having a healthy diet, decreasing alcohol and sugar consumption um, can help tremendously. Wow, that's a good tip. Yes, thank you so much. Now, because the influence of lifestyle usually starts in adolescence, how can we recognize the possibility of endometriosis occurring in our goals? And I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? Uh, how can we recognize the possibility of endometriosis occurring in our goals? Oh, so as you know, we're... Yeah, with the lifestyle, usually they don't start until the adolescence. And then right. this is girls that having a menstruation already started, are they uh, less likely to develop until when they turn to uh, the 20s or 30s? Um, you know, just because of when younger girls have cycles, we anticipate that they're going to be painful. And so sometimes I think we don't diagnose, we don't label it as endometriosis and we, we, we miss the diagnosis sometimes in adolescence. Um, but I do know that there are a number of adolescents who do um, have endometriosis. However, as you get older, because you're having more menstrual cycles and more flow of those cells out of the uterus, it becomes more common as you're getting older. And so we don't see it as, you know, the incidence isn't as great in adolescence as it is in our 20 year olds. However, it does occur in adolescence. And so it's something that should always be considered in an adolescent girl who's having particularly painful menstrual cycles. And we can't just attribute it to, you know, her having um, just the onset of uh, her menses and being an adolescent and just, you know, we can't chalk it up to that. And we do have to consider that it may be endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Is it a common protocol? You scrape the lining of the uterus to uh, look into the microscope? Uh, no, that's so typically because you're going to get endometrial. If you're scraping the lining of the uterus, then you're going to get endometrial cells. What typically oh if a um, woman has had, and there's a suspicion that she has endometriosis and she's having really severe symptoms, sometimes a physician will do what we call a diagnostic laparoscopy. So going in to take a look inside the belly to see if there's any evidence of endometrial implants. And they can look lots of different ways. And so if there's something that looks like we'll look at the surface of the uterus, look at the lining of the abdomen itself, look at the bladder, look at all of the other organs. And if there's tissue that looks like it's um, endometrial cells, we sample that and we send it to the pathologist. Um, one of the, the interesting things is a woman's symptoms do not correlate with the severity of her disease. So I can go into someone's belly to, you know, with the laparoscopic scope and take a look. And she just has a little bit of endometriosis, but she has really severe symptoms. And then there's other women, you can go in and their pelvis is just endometriosis everywhere to where everything is just stuck. And she barely has any pain whatsoever with her periods. And so it's, and that's one of the interesting things is the severity of the disease does not correlate with the severity of the patient's symptoms all the time. Oh, okay. Now, uh, when you do laparoscope uh, diagnostic, when you look inside, is it very typical this endometriosis growth and you can see it right away? It's like an acne or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so anything that's it's so usually it looks like little white spots or red spots or things like that. Um, and so what we just sample it and then send it to the pathologist and get a confirmation that it's actually endometriosis. I see. Okay. Now, <clears throat> are they um, uh, are they and how big is the role of the genetic? and epigenetic factors in the occurrence of endometriosis and adenomyosis? So there is 
a high correlation um, with genetics and, and families. And so we will expect that if a mom has it, her daughter will likely also experience. But like I said, we do see that it's not 100% penetrance, meaning you may have one daughter who has really severe symptoms and one daughter who has none. Um, so, you know, we can't always just go by genetics, but if a, if a mom has it, there is a high degree that a if a girl um, a girl if a young lady comes in and she's having symptoms and her mom had endometriosis, then most likely that's her diagnosis as well. Yeah. Now we talk about treatment just now, but uh, I think all the audience also would like to know what is uh, is there a treatment for uh, endometriosis and adenomyosis? So the treatments typically go from, we, we start out um, giving mild pain relievers. So using things like ibuprofen um, and Aleve to decrease the pain with the cycles. And then we look at um, hormonal things to decrease the menstrual cycles. And so that could be anywhere from birth control pills to um, IUDs, um, but anything that's hormonal that can decrease the menstrual flow and to and so what our goal is to decrease those estrogen surges that happen because when when a woman before a woman has her menstrual cycle she has an estrogen surge and those endometrial cells that are outside the uterus well they they don't know they're outside the uterus and so they get inflamed just like the ones inside the uterus and so our goal is to get rid of that spike so that those cells don't Act, you know, actively activate it. And so, and then if that doesn't work, then there's other medications that we use. And then the next phase is moving into doing surgical procedures. And so the vast majority of women will be on some type of hormonal treatment regimen. Does it work if it's um, adenomyosis? So for adenomyosis, sometimes the, like, like say we put her on a birth control pill, it can decrease the symptoms, but they tend to, they'll work, you know, they'll work for a little while and then they start having symptoms again. And so we either have to increase the dose of the medication or add a second something on top of it. And so that tends to grow, it gets more and severe, more severe over time. And m most of those women, um, either will have a hysterectomy or, you know, once they go through menopause, the symptoms are going to go away. Okay, well, since that is uh, con confined in the uterus, I think that's uh, probably they end up having a um, hysterectomy. How about the um, endometriosis? Isn't that very difficult, even though that they respond to treatments? Will, will, the, will the endometriosis progress? Um, so endometriosis, yes, it can progress. Um, sometimes we'll see that after women have babies, the endometriosis tends to slow down or, you know, it's like um, they sometimes will, they have, and you know, we have this spike in the 20s, 30s, and then the symptoms aren't so severe as a woman gets older. Um, but some women will, it will just progress, 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 where they have just severe debilitating disease. And so endometriosis is, is, is more variable. Um, like I said, it's so, it, there's just no correlation between disease and symptoms. And so endometriosis is, it's every woman is an individual with it. Whereas adenomyosis, we do tend to see that it progresses. Mm -hmm. So when you say, when you treat endometriosis and uh, when they progress, what do you do? Surgery, no surgery? Ablation, um, so, right? I heard something about ablation. Um, so you can, so some of those women will have surgeries and you will see sometimes you'll have a woman who's had multiple surgeries where um, a surgeon has gone in and ablated, so burned endometrial implants to get rid of them. Um, if it just, so those women, it's let's get you through your childbearing years. And then we decide on a definitive treatment and the definitive treatment typically is a hysterectomy. Oh, wow. Okay. Now 
about childbearing period for couples of childbearing age with infertility problems. How much influence does endometriosis and adenomyosis have on those on the hope for successful pregnancy and uh, procreation? Oh, both can have really, really detrimental effects on fertility. And so that's one of the things women who have endometriosis do have higher degrees of infertility and typically um, may have to see an infertility specialist to help with getting pregnant because they can have scar tissue and the endometrial implants just can affect their ability um, to implant the egg properly into the uterus. And so those women sometimes will need to, and, and then there's also the factor of them having the painful periods. And so in order to get pregnant, they usually have to go off the medications that are treating the endometriosis. And so it's kind of a catch 22 for them. But then also if they have really severe disease and they have scarring in the abdomen and the pelvis, that can actually block the tubes and make it difficult for the egg to get into the uterus and implant. So those women um, typically will need to see a um, reproductive endocrinologist and infertility doctor to assist with getting pregnant. Wow, okay. Now, are, are there any tips and ways to increase uh, the success, especially in the case with severe en endometriosis and uh, extensive adenomyosis? Um, well, the first thing is, I would say, early, early treatment. So if you're having these symptoms, have a discussion with your healthcare provider and I, you know, I always like to say, begin with the end in mind. And so meaning think about the ramifications of each of the treatment options. So have a very good discussion. Um, if I, you know, cause some of the medications mimic menopause. And when that happens, then we have to think about bone health and things like that. And so the key is to get informed and to have a very well-informed and in-depth conversation with your healthcare provider about your options. And then the other thing is always going to go back to, like we said, lifestyle, being on a healthy diet of whole foods and keeping sugar and artificial um, foods out of your diet as much as possible. Because those things, so the um, processed foods that we eat, they have an estrogenic-like effect in our body. So they are actually contributing to the problem. And if you can eliminate the processed foods from your diet, if you can eliminate sugar, if you can eliminate alcohol, your symptoms sometimes will be a lot less than when you're continuing to have those things in your diet. Um, but that's probably one of the best things a person can do. The thing that's you know in your control that you can do is to to look at your diet and eliminate all the artificial things that can be increasing your symptoms. Okay, thank you. Now, do you see if some someone, some woman has endometriosis and they get pregnant, it's possible, <laughs> right? Because it's not in the uterus now. Right. If they get pregnant, have you heard of the pregnancy actually heal the endometriosis. I have heard this many times. Yes. I just don't want yeah. Right. And that's what I, I, you know, some women will see that they have these severe, severe endometriosis and then they get pregnant and have a baby and they don't have symptoms again. And so I, I, I have seen that. Yes. Um, but definitely during the pregnancy, the symptoms, they're symptom free during the pregnancy, but then yes. they will see that after the pregnancy, they, you know, either the symptoms aren't as severe or they just don't have them anymore. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So it's not a myth. Okay. <laughs> no. I know it's a 30 minutes now, but I would like to uh, catch a, a couple of questions here. If you don't mind, Dr. Sherlena. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I'm not quite sure if this is uh, because I asked uh, the question, but I didn't get an answer. So this uh, woman has an implant in her nose, uh, cause uh, that cause because the nose bleeds every time during period. Is that any correlation with this implant? I don't think. I don't. I think uh, she misunderstood. Right? It's not I'm the not nose implant. I'm not going to say anything is impossible, but most likely oh. 
is more associated with the hormonal fluctuation that um, occurs and um, the blood, you know, what it does to her blood vessels. And so it, it may be hormonally associated, but not necessarily endometrial endometriosis. Um, because endometriosis, remember that it's not going to cause bleeding, it's going to cause pain. Um, and so if she had the endometriosis in her nose, she would get severe pain, but not necessarily a nosebleed. The nosebleed is most likely secondary to the hormonal fluctuation. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another one is uh, this um, lady said, you mentioned hysterectomy after surgery are all removed organs sent to a pathology how is the organ disposed or after the pathology examination is done? Um, so typically, yes, all organs are sent to a pathologist. Anything, anything that's removed from a patient is sent to a pathologist. It doesn't matter what it is, it's sent to pathology. Um, a lot of hospitals, especially if it's a university hospital, have programs where organs are sent either um, for research or for um to be a part of medical science or for um, some to some or just medical waste. So um, if a patient requests to have the organ returned to them, that's always a possibility, but most either end up being medical waste or are used for research purposes. Thank you for the answer. Now, um, can you uh, just uh, give a take home message for the listeners today? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So, you know, like always, it's always important to be your advocate, have a conversation with your healthcare provider. So if you are experiencing painful periods, heavy, heavy, heavy periods, and, you know, and know what your options are. Don't, a lot of times women are told that hysterectomy is the only option. And so they are rushed into having these surgeries that they may not necessarily have to have. So get informed, do your research, reach out to doctors like Dr. Maria, who can point you in the direction of someone who can answer your questions, but get no knowledge is always going to be your, your, the, the best thing you can have is knowledge so that you can advocate for yourself. Um, because one of the things you have to remember, we have a fair number of women, younger women, who have had hysterectomies for endometriosis. And truly, 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 if you're doing a hysterectomy for endometriosis, you also need to remove the ovaries. Taking a woman's ovaries when she is in her 20s or 30s is the worst thing you can do for her from a health standpoint, because you're literally shaving years off her life. And a lot of women are not told this. And they go in, they have these hysterectomies, they have their ovaries removed. And you know, Dr. Maria, what that does for their health, you know, when, when they don't have their own estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. So know your options to advocate for yourself and don't always accept that have, you know, throwing the baby out with the bath water is not always the best answer and, you know, get information. So places like this, this conversation right here are so important, you know, and it's, it's a really wonderful thing that Dr. Maria has created this so that you can get answers to your questions and have a better conversation with your healthcare provider. Thank you. Dr. Shirlena, what a brilliant uh, conversation we have today. And I want you to tell us um, a little bit about your uh, plan, your vision, and then how to get a hold of you if they need your help. And talk about the sexual health uh, you know, service that you're, you're giving all these uh, patients who really need it badly. Yes. So like you, know, like you mentioned, one of the things I recognize is that even as a gynecologist, I, don't ha I didn't get a lot of training in managing people's sexual health. And if I didn't get it as a gynecologist, a lot of other physicians didn't get it as well. Yet we know that sexual health is very important for everyone. And so I'm now stepping away from general obstetrics and gynecology and um, creating a new practice that solely focuses on managing sexual health for both men and women. Um, and so I'm in the process right now. I actually just, I, I have like two more obstetrics assignments I have to do, and then I will be officially done with doing obstetrics and delivering babies. Um, and then 
um, walking into this new venture. So for now, the best way to reach me is um, via my social media outlets, um, both Instagram and Facebook. They're both my name, Dr. Sherlina Bogard. That's D-R-S-H-Y-R-L-E-N-A Bogard, B-O-G-A-R-D. And um, you can always DM me. There's actually a link on both of them to schedule a consultation also. And so um, just going into the bio on both of those, there's links for scheduling um, online consultations. And so right now I'm only, I'm strictly doing online telemedicine appointments, um, no in-person as I'm developing out the others, the other business. Super, super. Thank you so much for helping me uh, to improve the community awareness. And oh, don't forget the like, Thumbs up for Dr. Sherlina. And thank you so much for listening. I'm Dr. Maria Sulindra, Integrative Anti-Aging Medicine, and I'll see you next week the same time. Thank you, Dr. Sherlina. You have a beautiful night. You too. Bye. Have a nice long weekend. Yes. Thank you.